We have completed the first two modules of this course about photographs and uh, 3D surface data, respectively. Thank you for continuing to attend. And especially thank you for attending the third module, which is about volumetric medical images, 3D uh, images of usually of parts of the human body or of the bodies of animals of some kind. Um, the way I described it earlier to you is that basically with, with, you start with a filled in 3D object such as your body, right? And then to get data from it, you can either use volumetric medical images to get a sense of the properties of not just the stuff on the surface of the object, but of the tissue that is inside the middle of the object. So taking a volumetric medical scan, you don't just get to see what my skin and my clothes look like, you get to see what my liver and my kidneys and my heart and my stomach look like. 3D range data is different in the sense that we only get to look at the outer external surface of the object and photographs are even more different in that the 3D data about the shape of my body or whatever the object is has been projected onto a 2D plane. <laughs> Now, we spent a little bit of time, we spent one class talking about the different ways in which range data or 3D surface data can be acquired. We talked about the different physical principles that are involved and what the catches are. And just as a kind of executive summary of that talk, for surface data, we can bounce energy off of surfaces and wait for it to come back and we catch it. And we can use time of flight to basically count the amount of time that it takes for energy to bounce off of an object and come back. We can use triangulation to bounce energy off of an object or let the sun bounce energy off of an object from one location and see where we catch it in another location for triangulation. And we can use either triangulation or time of flight to figure out how far away these surfaces are. Now, for photographs, we simply just wait for light from Mr. Sun or from a light source to bounce off of the object and we catch it. But again, the theme here is that we don't get to see the guts of anything, literally. We don't get to see the internals of an, of an object that we're looking at. So the key distinguishing characteristic is, is exactly that, that we get to look at the internals of the thing that we are imaging in volumetric medical images. So mathematically, instead of getting a 2D array of floating point numbers, such as you would get from a grayscale image with higher values representing brighter locations in the image and lower numbers representing darker locations in the image. And unlike getting a set of 3D surface positions, 3D point coordinates and how they're connected to each other via edges, that's what you get in range data, you get basically a 3D array of data. So usually we always think about matrices as being two-dimensional things. It has a row and a column. So now we're going to talk about 3D arrays, which have basically a row, a column, and a third dimension to it. So you can think about a basically something like a Rubik's Cube of data, where every, uh, where every, there's a 3D set, basically a 3D indexes of your data. And the notion is that for every 3D position in this Rubik's Cube part of the world, you get a number. And that number tells you something about the characteristics of the material that is at that location in the world. And again, the point is that it's filled in. So these are often referred to as volumetric images because instead of just a surface, you have a filled in volume of material. And sometimes they're referred to as tomographs. And you'll he hear the words, and you'll hear various techniques referred to as blah, blah, blah tomography. Well, that's exactly what this means, is using various techniques to get 3D filled in arrays that tell you the properties of materials in the world. Now, um, I don't want to sugarcoat this. Acquisition of medical imaging data is hugely complicated. It is tremendously, tremendously complicated in practice, and you can spend your entire career just focusing on one method of acquiring volumetric medical images. In fact, Paul Lederber and his colleagues won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in I think it was 2004 or so, simply for inventing the magnetic resonance image. 
However, for our purposes, we can think of a couple of very simple, simplified principles that come from physics that help us to acquire three different kinds of volumetric medical images. <laughs> And these very simplified notions are, are what drive the very complicated technologies that are built around them. So the first very simple principle is that if you shoot very high beams, or if, you, if you shoot beams of very high frequency energy through an object, they'll tend to go through the object. However, they will also tend to be absorbed by the material within the object as it is shooting through. So the idea is that the amount of energy that comes out the other side of the object, as opposed to being absorbed, tells you something about the material properties along the line of travel of that beam of very high frequency energy. So you can think of this as being probing the material properties along one line of travel for one beam of energy and getting a sense of the material properties by how much energy gets through it. And if you do that repeatedly from repeated directions, you can back out the material properties at every 3D location. So that's the first kind of simplified scientific notion. The second idea is to more or less use the tissue inside of the object as something like a radio antenna transmitter system. As bizarre as that might sound. In fact, the bizarreness of it is probably why these guys won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. So the idea is that if you take lower frequency energy, in fact radio frequency energy that is not all that different from what comes out of the radio antenna for FM radio, then and you, sh you beam that into biological tissue such as skin or muscle or neurons in your brain, then uh, the, the atoms in that material will absorb the energy. And hopefully you recall from physics that when, um, when uh, materials absorb energy, the atoms get excited and they move into a higher, a more excited, freak, a more excited state. However, um, all materials try to move themselves to a lower state of energy, so eventually those atoms emit the energy that you just gave them. And it turns out, it's fairly non-obvious, but it turns out that the time course with which it releases that energy tells you something about the material. And different types of biological tissue spit out the energy that you beam into them uh, with different characteristics over time. That is the kind of simplified biological principle underlying magnetic resonance. And the third one is even simpler than both of the above. Simply put, if you attach radioactive material to a biological tissue, you can use the radioactive substance as something like a homing device. If you recall from detective movies or um, James Bond type movies, if you attach a homing device to a car, as the car goes away, it gives off a beacon telling you where it is. Radioactive material like you know, such as you would use in a nuclear power plant, gives off radioactive decay. High energy particles shoot off from it. So if you attach something radioactive to, say, blood, and, and you want to know where the blood goes, you can see where the blood goes by looking at where the radioactive decay is coming off of it. So respectively, we have just gone through the very, very kind of simplified notions that underlie computed tomography, a.k.a. three-dimensional x-rays, magnetic resonance imaging, and positron emission tomography, or PET. Also, there's a thing called SPECT, single photon emission computed tomography, which is a lot like PET and falls under the third category. The only difference between PET and SPECT is that in PET, the homing device gives off two particles in opposite directions, and in SPECT, it only gives off one. That's the main difference. And again, in practice, the actual devices for these things are hugely complicated, but they're underlied by these three principles. Let's start by computed tomography. Just in terms of terminology, we have a 
a device that generates these high frequency, very high energy beams of uh, energy. It's called an emitter. It's an X-ray emitter. And typically what this thing is, is a device that gives off a plane of these rays that come out. They go choo, out like this. And you have some object like your abdomen or your brain that you are trying to, where well, you're trying to get a sense of the internal structure of the object based on um, these x-rays. Now, um, what happens is that you emit the x-rays and then they go through the object and they are detected by the detector, which is on the other side of the object. So the x-rays travel through the object and are detected over here. So ideally, and this is generally true, you have a good sense of the energy characteristics of the x-rays that are being emitted. So you know how, what their, their energy level is. And furthermore, the detector does a pretty good job of telling you how much energy is being caught by it. So you can basically tell how much energy was lost as the x-ray traveled from here to here. So what happens when an x-ray is shooting through your body is that it's basically going through gaps in between molecules in your body. So in some parts of your body, like, um, oh, like the fluid in your intestinal tract, those molecules are not packed very tightly together. So you can think of it as being big, big spaces in between the molecules, okay? So it makes sense then that as this x-ray is shooting through, it's going to collide with very few of those molecules, relatively speaking. Meanwhile, there are other parts of your body where the molecules are packed together like bricks on a brick wall. And so it should make sense that the x-ray is going to crash into a lot of those molecules as it passes through that very densely packed tissue. Bone is a good example of that. Now the process of what I'm describing as x-rays crashing into molecules as they are traveling in a straight line through your object, that's called attenuation. Because every time an x-ray bumps into a particle, it loses some of its energy. It basically transfers some of its kinetic energy to the molecule that it just bumped into. Um, not unlike a billiard ball uh, sort of slowing down. This is a little bit different, but uh, if you shoot a billiard ball and it's going straight and it crashes into other balls, it will transfer some of its kinetic energy to the other balls, which makes the other balls move. And it makes it slow down. So it's attenuation. It's making the energy in the x-ray attenuated. Now, and how much they change their energy depends in this intuitive way on the properties of the material that it's going through. So if an x-ray goes through bone, it loses a lot of energy because it's bashing into so many particles. If it's going through fluid, it loses very little because it's bashing into fewer. Okay? So now what we've done, if we do one of these kind of x-ray projections, and again, this is another piece of terminology, you're basically getting a 2D projection of the attenuation properties onto your detector, then we have some sense, at least from that direction, how much, something about the material properties of all the material that is along each line of travel. So we don't really have 3D information yet. At each position on our detector, we don't have a sense of what the material property is at this position and this position and this position. We have, in some sense, an agglomeration of all of the information along the entire line of travel. So we don't really have fully 3D information yet. So what do we do? We then take this idea to the bank and we have instead of just one emitter detector system where we have an emitter here and a detector here, we have a bunch of them covering different directions of travel. And in a CT system, you might have 10 or 15 or 20 of these emitter detector systems that are all at different, that are all tuned to detect different lines of travel. So from these, you can basically back out the material properties of every 3D position in space by conjecturing at what the material properties must have been to generate all of these different disparate sets of detector readings. So basically, here's an example for one position in 3D space. I have to 
decide what the material property is at this 3D position in space such that the reading along this line of travel, is so such that it's consistent with the detector reading at this line of travel and this line of travel and this one. So really what we're trying to do is say, hmm, I have a big set of 2D projections of my data that cover a set of different orientations. What are the possible sets of objects that could have given rise to all of those different measurements? And the most popular algorithm for doing this conjecturing is called back projection. So basically what you do is you sort of start at the detector location and you paint the scene with energy. So you kind of make a guess that the attenuation of the x-ray followed some kind of smooth and increasing path as it went from the emitter to the detector. And so you kind of paint that energy across the scene. And if you do that for all of your detector emitter systems, then you get some sense of what the material properties could have been. And basically what you can do is do that back projection for all of your different detector emitter systems and then average them all together somehow. Now, the, there are a ton of details that go on top of that that make this thing hugely complicated, but that's basically what you need to know about how CT works. So, let's take this principle of X-rays bashing into molecules and losing energy and take it a bit further. In particular, let's say that we want to uh, tag the blood somehow in the way that I described for PET and use it as a homing device of sorts. In other words, be able to tag the blood in some way and see where the blood goes. So in the brain, this is really useful because one of the most common things that happens to you in terms of uh, medical problems as you become extremely old is called stroke or infarction, which is basically a blockage or a bursting of a blood vessel in the brain. So it makes sense that you might want to uh, tag blood as it's leaving the heart and be able to track it and see where it goes in the brain. If you have had a burst blood vessel, you should see a pool of this blood developing somewhere in the brain. If you have a blockage, then you should see blood moving along, moving along, and then suddenly stopping. Contrast enhanced CT is the, is the way to use this, is the way to apply this homing device principle to CT. In particular, what we can do is develop a compound or some kind of fluid that instead of having loosely uh, loosely packed molecules actually has very, very densely passed, packed molecules in the fluid. This is called a contrast agent. This is a substance that is known to attenuate x-rays a lot, and I mean a lot, like bone, just because we have synthesized it in such a way that these molecules are tightly packed together and don't let x-rays through it very easily. So then, inject that into your patient and see where the blood goes. So if you inject that into the patient, you basically have this bolus of material that is known to attenuate x-rays. So you wait for that to go to the heart and get pushed up into the brain, and then take an x-ray, or take one of these CT scans. And if you do that, you should get a lot of x-ray attenuation, more than you would expect, wherever the contrast has gone. So this is called contrast-enhanced CT. And in fact, contrast-enhanced CT, contrast CTs are uh, kind of bizarre to look at if you don't know that they're contrast-enhanced, because what you'll get is a very, very bright region corresponding to the skull, because as I've said, the skull doesn't let x-rays through it very well. And then you might have this big blotch of very bright material wherever the stroke is in the middle. And you know it's not bone, so it has to be contrast. Any questions about contrast enhanced CT? Okay, let's spend a little while on MRI. Now, let's start by going back to the basic physics of it. We have atoms. Those are those, the yellow and the red ball there. Um, and let's say that you excite the atom by basically beaming energy into it. And that's what the wiggly arrows are. We know from physics that, as I said earlier, the atom will basically excite. So the electrons move into higher orbitals than their basic one. 
And however, over time, atoms tend to move towards lower energy states. That's one of your basic physical principles. So it will absorb that energy, become excited, and then emit it basically as fast as it can. Now I want you to take it on faith that how quickly they let off the energy depends on the structure of the atom and how it is organized in tissue. And so for example, if you excite atoms that are in a particular kind of organic material that has a certain kind of molecular structure to it, it might give off that energy very, very fast and in all directions equally. And if you have an organic material that has a different molecular structure, it will give off that energy with a different spatial and frequency pattern. One problem, though, if we want to actually leverage this principle to measure something about our material properties, is that in practice, it will give off this energy in all different directions. So now, if we want to back out something about the properties of the material that we're looking at, we basically have to listen for this energy coming out from all different orientations, which is a nuisance. But here's the basic principle is that we beam energy into a material much like a radio transmitter antenna, and then we are like a radio transmitter, and then we are the antenna. We listen for the energy coming out. And if the energy has certain characteristics, we say, oh, well, that looks like it must be blood. And if it has another, some other properties, we say, oh, well, it looks like it must be visceral fat. But again, there's this problem that the energy is given off in all different directions to varying degrees. And practically, the reason why this is a problem is that we want to have, in terms of the devices, it's very difficult to build a, an all-encompassing uh, energy detector, so an all-encompassing antenna that covers all 360 degrees in order to listen for this energy coming out of the object. So the way we get around this and we, the way we are able to detect the energy coming out in just one direction as opposed to kind of panospherically around the object is to force the atoms in the material to resonate. And here's what that means. There are some atoms that have asymmetries, like H1 uh, hydrogen, P31, carbon-13, fluoron-19, and so on, which is to say they have a non-zero nuclear spin. There are valence electrons that spin around the nucleus in a particular orbit that, in fact, actually induces an itty-bitty, teeny-tiny magnetic field. So if you recall from physics, especially electromagnetism, uh, if you have an electric charge and that electric charge is moving around in a circle, then the right-hand rule tells you that you have induced a magnetic field that's in the direction of your thumb. This is one of Maxwell's equations, right? So it turns out that you don't feel it because it's so tiny, but every water molecule in your body has induced an itty-bitty, teeny-tiny magnetic field that is oriented along the dipole of the hydrogen atoms. And a way to represent that graphically is like this. If you have a cup of water, then the hydrogen atoms will have this magnetic field where, again, basically the, the, uh, the structure of the electrons that are spinning around the nucleus are such that they're spinning like this, and so the magnetic field is pointing in this direction. And in a cup of water, there's no organization to these hydrogen atoms. They're all in different directions, and all, therefore all of the magnetic fields induced by all of the dipoles are all in kind of random orientations and directions. So what was the plan that was hatched for trying to more easily detect energy being emitted by these atoms after you beam energy into them? is to apply an external magnetic field, which is called B0, that's oriented in one orientation like this. If you do that, what will happen is that all of these individual magnetic fields that are all in random orientations will tend to align themselves with that magnetic field. So instead of the previous figure where you had some magnetic fields going in this direction and some in this direction and some in that direction, they will tend to whoop, they will all tend to line up with B0. Not perfectly though. 
So they will actually, in fact, be spinning around, processing is the term, uh, with some angle of declension with respect to B0. And what this basically means is that the stronger the magnetic field, the better job you're able to do getting all of your hydrogen atoms or carbon-13 atoms or fluorine-19 atoms or whatever it is to line up exactly with B0. But that takes an incredibly strong magnetic field. So instead, we settle for having them process uh, around B0 at a certain angle. So they spin uh, more or less in the B0 direction. And the stronger B0 is, the more they align to it. So now we have all of our magnetic dipoles oriented in the same direction. So what? Well, the interesting thing that happens to these guys physically is that if you blast them with a certain kind of radio frequency energy that is oriented perpendicular to B0, so you have radio frequency energy coming in this way, what will happen is that these guys will actually flip. Their spins will flip. That's the terminology. They'll go from having their dipoles oriented this way to having their dipoles oriented this way. And the more energy, as you keep pulsing them with energy, they will keep their magnetic spins, is the term, in this flipped orientation. But then the magnetic field B0 is still there. So they're going to try to align themselves with B0, and they're going to fail to because you are bombarding them with radio frequency energy. So then, but at the same time, as I've said, they're getting excited. So they're storing energy up. They're storing energy up inside of them. So then what happens when you shut off the radio frequency energy? Well, what happens is that the atom both gives off its energy and starts reorienting itself towards B0. And if you're saying, so what, the consequence of that is that they tend to give off their energy in pre-specified directions. And in particular, they will tend to give off their energy in this orientation in the same perpendicular direction to B0 as you applied the radio frequency pulse in the first place. So this is all just a way of saying that, that instead of allowing atoms to give off their energy in random orientations as we're trying to figure out its material properties, we are forcing it to give off its energy in particular orientations. And again, how quickly in the time course and the frequency course of how it gives off this energy after you've pulsed it into it tells you something about the material properties. It tells you whether it's fat or neuron or muscle or skull or what. And this is just another uh, example of the same thing. You have RF energy, radio frequency energy going in. The thing is flipped. And then as it's processing back towards B0, it's giving off signal like this. And in fact, this is the typical readout that you get from a magnetic resonance image per atom. You'll get a signal that looks like this, and then it tapers off with some uh, time course. And the time course is, is uh, represented by a parameter called T2. So if you get an MRI, you might, uh, they might tell you that it is T1 weighted or T2 weighted. Well, what I've described to you is what's called spin echo MRI, which is T2 weighted. And it turns out that uh, infarcts have a particular time course T2 parameter that is different from the T2 course uh, or the T2 parameter for normal brain tissue which is a little bit different but not by much from the T2 parameter that governs this release of energy for skull again complicated the implementation details are hairy but does the general principle make sense are there any questions okay Great. Now, um, uh, magnetic resonance technology is evolving very quickly. And there are a number of different variants on this theme of, uh, of spin echo MRI. So the reason it's called spin echo is that you are changing the magnetic spins of the atoms, and you are waiting for the echo of energy coming out of it. So it's like uh, it's a little bit analogous to standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon and yelling and waiting for the echo to bounce back to you. <laughs>
Um, and again, the energy coming out of the atom is the echo coming out of it. There's basically two key technologies that underlie everything that you do in MRI. One is spin echo, which we've talked about. The other one's called gradient echo, and I don't have the time to, t to talk about gradient echo. So you're only responsible for kind of knowing how spin echo works. So yeah. Um, oh, and not only will the so basically not only will the time course of energy give off uh, tell you something about the material, but you can also detect the energy from different orientations as well. And it should be the case that energy that is not coming out in the direction in a direction kind of 90 degrees off from the transmitter should be relatively weak, but you can still do it. Okay, well, if there's no questions about that, let's talk about PET. So, let's say you have a radioactive substance. Um, and a couple of these that are, that are common nowadays are fluorine-18 and carbon-11. So those are two. And you ask yourself, what happens over time if I just observe this radioactive substance? It is not stable. It is giving off radioactive decay at every moment in time. And if you remember from physics again, every radioactive substance has a half-life, which is to say the amount of time that it takes half of the material to radioactively decay, right? So at every moment in time, these radioactive substances are giving off radioactive decay. What does that mean? Well, for things like fluorine-18 and carbon-11, what happens is that there is a nucleus that gives off a positively charged particle called a positron, uh, which smashes into an electron and annihilates both of them. So it's actually emitting a positively charged particle, which, as I've said, sort of crashes into an electron, annihilates, and they annihilate each other. And what happens is that they give off two very high-frequency uh, particles called gamma rays, which move off and emit at almost exactly 180 degree angles with respect to each other. And again, if you are holding fluorine-18 in your hand, or if you're holding a chunk of carbon-11 in your hand, I wouldn't suggest you do that. But if you did, this would be happening all the time for many, for, uh, in every location in the, in the radioactive substance, always having these 180 degree apart gamma rays being shot off. And in fact, um, the reason why we are worried about the safety of radioactive substances for nuclear power plants and so on is that these uh, gamma rays, if you, the more of them you catch in your body, the worse off it is for you at high doses. It can cause you know, your cells to get uh, damaged and so on. But again, the key thing here is that the byproduct of having fluorine-18 just sit there is these high energy particles that go off at 180 degree angles. So let's say that we build a system that is designed to detect the presence of these gamma rays. And in fact, not only can it detect them, but it can tell you what time, in terms of wall time, that they caught them to a very, very, very high degree of precision. So what should happen then is if I have an object that has this radioactively decaying substance in it, I should be able to start my stopwatch, wait for one of these guys to decay, and after a certain amount of time, this detector will catch one of them and be able to figure out what time it caught it at. And similarly, because you, both of these rays were emitted at the same moment in time this way and that way, this emitter at a sh very short period of time after that should detect that there's a gamma ray coming into this one. So we know that somewhere along this line of travel there was a, a decayed, uh, a, a piece of, of a fluorine 18 atom that decayed. And because we know the time that it took to get from here to here, and from here to here, we can back out the 3D position of that fluorine atom as it was being emitted. 
So that's the principle. And, and just in terms of terminology, the line that these guys move along is called the line of response. It's basically the line of travel of those gamma of that one pair of gamma rays going off in, in both directions. And this is what this is how you get a homing beacon out of these fluorine 18 atoms. The gamma rays act as a sort of homing beacon for that. And by the way, the fluorine 18 is referred to interchangeably as a radioisotope or a radio tracer. And the reason we all use the term radio tracer is to get at this uh, notion that it's supposed to be, we're supposed to be tracing where it is going over time. Does that make sense? So that's why you're able to use this ring or this array of detectors to detect how much and where this decomposing nuclear material is. So that doesn't seem all that interesting in and of itself because uh, it's unclear what you could possibly get out of just detecting where the radioisotope goes. You could use it for blood flow. You can just inject someone with fluorine 18, fluorine 18 and similar to the case with stroke, if you wanted to see just where the blood went, you could see where the radioactive decay is going on. But PET is actually even, excuse me, the, but PET is even more elaborate than that. Because you can start with a radioactive molecule, like fluorine-18, and attach other stuff to it. Or actually, a better way to put that is attach it to other stuff. And in particular, you can attach it to molecules that your body uses all the time in terms of its, in order to maintain its normal functioning. And furthermore, you can also attach it to molecules that are used a lot in, in, in cases of abnormal functioning, things like cancer. And the, um, the simplest case of this is sugar. So in order to make your neurons fire in your brain, uh, there is a fuel supply that you need for that. And the one that's used by your brain is glucose. It's the, sh the simplest sugar molecule there is. So, and it turns out that you can actually hijack sugar molecules and attach fluorine-18 to them. So the fluorine-18 hijacked sugar goes to the brain wherever your brain is using sugar to fuel the firing of neurons. And so in that sense, you can see, based on where you detect where the fluorine went, you can back out where the sugar went, which is how you back out where the neurons are firing. Another example of this is that um, cancer basically consists of cells that have gone haywire in terms of their program that tells them when to divide versus when to not divide, which means that they just divide at an alarming, ridiculous rate. Um, now, all that dividing requires uh, energy, and sugar will readily fuel that process. It takes energy to split an atom up and to do all that stuff. So if you want to get a sense of how virulent a tumor is in cancer or how quickly it is growing or spreading, you can again inject the body with fluorine 18 hijacked sugar, which is called fluorodeoxyglucose or FDG. I think that's in the next slide. Um, and where if, if a lot of sugar goes to the tumor, that means it's dividing at a rapid rate and it's really quickly using up that energy. If not, then maybe it's not dividing so quickly. Ah, and this is basically what I just said. So uh, again, the, the, and this might be the most common radio tracer used nowadays, especially for the brain and in cancer, fluorodeoxyglucose, but there are other ones. And it's, they, but they all are instances of this general principle of taking a molecule that, it, that tends to go somewhere in the normal abnormal functioning of the, the human body and attach a homing device to it, which is a radioactive particle like fluorine-18 or carbon-11. Any questions about this? OK. Um, yeah, and here's just some more examples of other radio tracers. Heavy, heavy oxygen, O15, um, you can attach it to water and oxygen. Usually water tends to go everywhere, but in certain applications you really want to see where the water went. Um, nitrogen 13 attaches to ammonia, which is a component of blood, so you can again uh, 
have it latch on to the blood and see where the blood goes in certain applications. And, um, and carbon-11 can be used for various things to help you track where things like amino acid uptake and protein synthesis are taking place in the brain. Now, the key problem with PET is that, is what I said kind of in the beginning, which is that if you're holding fluorine-18 in your hand, without telling it to do so, it is already giving off radioactive decay, which means that you have a limited amount of time to manufacture it in the first place, because it's all manufactured, uh, inject it into somebody, and then look for the energy coming out. Fluorine has a half-life of about two hours, so it's actually viable for someone in another city to manufacture fluorine 18 for you, ship it to you via FedEx same day, if they can get it to you within about an hour, and then you grab it and immediately inject the person with it and then listen for the radioactive decay. Carbon-11, however, is... Well, carbon-11 and heavy oxygen are, are much worse than that. You only have about 20 minutes before your manufactured heavy oxygen turns into nothing through the radioactive decay. And so um, in carbon-11, the half-life is about 45 to 60 minutes, as it turns out. So that's why in PET centers, the really state-of-the-art PET imaging centers, they tend to have an atom smasher, which is how you manufacture these things, called a cyclotron. They have the thing that manufactures the radio tracer, and in the very next room, you have the, uh, the person who is waiting to get their PET scan. So then you have the physicist who runs the cyclotron and manufactures the radioisotope, and then it's immediately walked, run next door and ejected into the person. And in fact, some places have these neat vacuum tube systems so that if the, the cyclotron is in one part of the building and the PET scanner is in another, they manufacture the radioisotope and put it in the vacuum tube system that kind of gets automatically shot over to the PET center where they then inject the person. But the practical problem is that out in the sticks, in the rural areas, you basically can't get a PET scan for this reason. That, no, you know, in your small, in, in Dixon, they're not going to put in a $3 million cyclotron to manufacture uh, materials like fluorine-18 for the couple thousand people, 2% of which need a PET scan, right? And kind of the, in terms of the technology, where the technology is going, more and more people are taking useful scientific measurements derived from exotic uh, radio tracers like heavy oxygen and carbon-11, and they're trying to shoehorn it into fluorine because it has this longer half-life. And you could potentially manufacture uh, fluorodeoxyglucose in Sacramento and drive very quickly to Dixon and, and administer it. Okay, so, oh, well, I think this, this might be the first time that this has ever happened. We're going to end early. So CT, just to summarize, examines how the materials within your body or within some object attenuate x-rays that they're bombarded with. The more densely packed the molecules are, the more energy gets zapped out of the x-ray as it goes through. And from multiple measurements of that, you back out the 3D structure of the object. MRI turns every dipole uh, structured atom into a radio antenna of sorts, beams energy into it, and then listens for the time course and the frequency course of energy that is emitted from it. And that time course and frequency course tells you something about the structure of the material. PET attaches... Oh, sorry, one other thing I forgot to... Uh, one other piece of terminology is that the radioactive material is either referred to as a radioisotope, a radio tracer, or a radio ligand. That's the almost interchangeably used term. Um, and, but what PET does is it attaches radioactive homing beacons to molecules that your body uses, like sugar. Any questions about any aspect of this? Okay, well, again, um, you can spend your life just focusing on one of these, but that's, and the details in practice are extremely shockingly complicated, but that's the basics. Okay, uh, again, uh, Jing should have your midterms at office hours starting now, basically. Um, and if you want more, you know, if you want to talk about something with me, then I'm glad to make appointments since I forgot to bring them to office hours last time. Okay, thank you. <laughs>